Young love. For some, it is the rawest, most innocent version of love we will ever get to experience. And how far would one go for it? Precisely, 1653.8 miles was Mike Mansholt's reply to that question in 2016. 17-year-old Mike was head over heels in love with his girlfriend, who had traveled to Malta to study English. And Mike, who was an avid traveler, had decided to follow her there. It was to be his first solo trip abroad and the couple was to leave the island together a few days later. But when his plane takes off on July the 22nd, Mike never boards. Only a few days later, the teenager's body is found at the bottom of the Dingley Cliffs. When the body is then sent in for an autopsy, the results are shocking. Malta is located in the Mediterranean Sea, an hour and a half south of Sicily. The island is very densely populated. Around 516 100 inhabitants live on Malta on 316 square kilometers. Each citizen has at least one car and you can only imagine the traffic, let alone the time it takes to find a parking space. This is especially true for its capital Valletta. The city is unique and unlike any other capital in Europe. Upon entering Valletta, one immediately steps into a fortress. In fact, the entire city is surrounded by many well-preserved fortifications. Its bright buildings, narrow streets, beautiful gardens and sea views make for a very romantic experience, so a great place for the young couple to reunite. But first, a bit about Mike. Mike Mansholt hailed from Oldenburg, Germany, where he lived with his mother, father, sister Maria and brother Daniel. He was especially close to his father Bernd, who worked as a goldsmith and with whom he had much in common. He considered his father to be his best friend. And Bernd and Mike would spend a lot of time together. They would play Clash of Clans or talk about their love life. Bernd would talk about his marriage to Mike's mom, which sadly fell apart, and Mike would talk about his girlfriend and their relationship. They were just really close. The two sons' favorite hobby was flying RC planes, and this inspired Mike to build airplanes for a living. He then became a trainee with Airbus and actually beat hundreds of applicants to the position. Prior to that, Mike had graduated from high school and finished top of his class. Needless to say, his father was extremely proud of his son and still is to this day. Band said that his son was reliable to a fault and was just a very nice person. He was outspoken but quiet, balanced, conscientious and eager to experiment, but was by no means looking for danger. He was an adventurous young man and had a genuine zest for life. And Mike very much got his spirit for adventure and exploration from his dad, who loved to take his family sailing. In 2004, when Mike was only five years old, the Mansholt family set out for foreign shores in an epic world cruise, taking them from the North Sea via the Canary Islands to the Caribbean. The Mansholts were at sea for 774 days, quite a feat. But despite the holiday of all holidays, the desire for more travel remained upon their return. In one of their latest travels, Mike went gold panning with his father on the Yukon River in Canada. Another thing Bernd passed on to his son was his love for sports. For his 18th birthday, the two had planned to run what would have been Mike's first marathon together in Iceland. Mike loved all things sports, though he preferred individual sports over team activities. He enjoyed skating, cycling, running, climbing and even diving. But above all, he loved gymnastics and just generally liked to spend time outdoors. It is this desire that led him to develop an interest in seeing the St. Paul's catacombs in Ir Rabat, Malta. The catacombs, which are located just outside Medina, form a typical complex of interconnected underground Roman cemeteries that were in use up to the 7th and possibly the 8th centuries. Additionally, he was eager to see the Dingley Cliffs which are located not far from the village of Dingley. 
At 253 meters above sea level, the cliffs are the highest part of the island and as such, a popular attraction for tourists visiting Malta. Heading there for a peaceful walk with boasting views of Filfa and the Mediterranean Sea. So in July 2016, Mike, following many family vacations, decided it was time for his first solo trip. He just wanted to get away by himself and explore a country on his own, which is understandable, he was adventurous. And what better way than to visit his girlfriend in Malta? Being so close to his dad, Mike of course immediately shared his plans with him, and Bernd was proud and happy for his son. Bernd remembered how for his first solo trip, he went camping by bike in a neighboring village, so he said to his son, if your first trip is to Malta, what comes after? Insinuating it is such a long way from home and he anticipated his son's future trips to be even more exciting. This of course makes what happened after even sadder. July came and Mike was very excited to be jetting off, seeing his girlfriend and exploring a place he had researched so much about. So he flies out to Malta and checks into the Astra Hotel, where he stays in room 105. The hotel is located in Sliema, a resort town in the eastern part of Malta, and is especially celebrated for its nightlife and shopping hubs. So a great place to stay for a young person. Mike then proceeds to spend the first part of his vacation with his girlfriend. The two hadn't seen each other in a while and were in a new place together, understandably, they had lots to talk about and explore. As July the 17th, the couple's joint departure nears, Mike begins to feel that he hasn't actually seen enough of the island just yet. His girlfriend, having been there a bit longer, had had more time to explore and he really felt that he could benefit from having some alone time to do his own sightseeing, maybe some of the things she had already seen. He really liked to take pictures, so that is something he wanted to do. Mike then decides not to get on the plane with her, but stay a few days longer, until July the 22nd to be precise, while his girlfriend left according to plan. The two said their goodbyes and parted ways. The next day, Mike was up early and ready to seize the day. CCTV of July the 18th shows Mike wearing a blue t-shirt, sunglasses and a backpack over his shoulder. He also had a mobile phone in his hand, a black Samsung Galaxy Note, and brought along a GoPro camera. Mike left his room at 8.39am that day, and returned at 10 past 9am to ask for the bill. The cameras then show him at 9.55.03 locking his door. After that, he stepped out of the lobby and walked down to the harbor. After leaving the hotel, Mike borrowed a blue-black mountain bike from the harbor, a Lombarda 270 with a particularly light frame, and he had planned to visit the catacombs in Rabat that day. At 10.11 am, Mike is then online for the last time as he sends a voice message to his girlfriend. In the message, he said, Okay, I'll rent a bike now and then ride through Malta today. However, the roads are so steep, I'll send you a photo right away. You can only walk up some of them, uh, can't even go up there on the bike. But it doesn't matter, it's a sporting challenge and I like that. From the message one can conclude that he was in great spirits, he was well prepared, having researched the area beforehand, and he was an athletic guy, so definitely up for the journey ahead. Despite it being a scorching hot day, remember, Mike loved the outdoors. But later that day, when Mike was supposed to be back at the harbor and return his rented mountain bike, he doesn't show. The Maltese authorities were then contacted to locate him, and so were his parents. Mike at this point had stopped answering calls or texts, but his parents nor the Maltese authorities were that worried yet. But it is not uncommon for a tourist to bring back a bike late or whatever it is they rented, maybe a boat or who knows. I mean, tourists do it every day. You're busy, you forget the time and this happens. But then, July the 22nd rolls around and Mike's mom and sister are stood waiting at Bremen's airport. Flight LH360, scheduled to land at 10.15pm, is first delayed and then cancelled. Mike's mom immediately phones her son to see if perhaps he got stuck in Frankfurt before catching the connecting flight, but he doesn't respond, not to the first call or any following ones. His mom then grows restless and frantically calls around, trying to see if her son had even been on that flight. He hadn't. 
she reaches out to Band to inform him that their son hadn't arrived home as scheduled. They also had not had an update from him in days. Bernd at the time was vacationing in Croatia and took the first available flight back to Germany. On his way there, he kept trying to remain calm, thinking of all the reasons why Mike could have not shown up. Maybe he lost his mobile phone, maybe he missed his flight or was robbed. Meanwhile, his mom couldn't wait for her ex-husband to get back. She reported her son missing that same night at 2.19am. The police officer on duty types in the characteristics of Mike into the computer to create a profile for him. 5'5", five five, natural red hair, muscular build. But suddenly, he is startled. When he looks at their internal police system, he finds that a search for Mike was already launched in Malta four days ago. According to the data, Mike hadn't been seen on the island since the morning of July the 18th, when he was supposed to return his mountain bike. He also finds out that the hotel manager waited four days before she notified the police. And all that time, nobody told the family he never made it back to the hotel. Meanwhile, Mike's dad was due to arrive in Frankfurt the morning of July the 23rd. But it was only to be a layover before he headed off to Malta to look for his son. This is something he wanted to do himself, and considering how close and similar they were, I can definitely see why Bernd would believe he could find his son. And Bernd decided to make use of his layover in Frankfurt, and speak to airport police who then relayed the information he gave them to the BKA. This is when the Bundeskriminalamt, the Federal Criminal Police Office, or BKA, took over the case. Under this umbrella, the entire international police began to work together. The case immediately became a high-priority assignment, and Mike's mother gave authorities photos of her son, as well as his bank details and mobile phone number. The BKA has experts working on cases such as Mike's disappearance in a unit called Sirene. Sirene consists of a special team of investigators with access to names, biometric images and fingerprints, and they focus on nothing else but high-priority cases. Bernd became an active part of search efforts and to this day is at the very forefront in seeking justice for his son. In the first days of the investigation, Bernd trusted the police and followed their every move. Mike's brother Daniel also flew out to Malta to help his dad in the search for his brother. On July the 24th, 2016, the BKA then checked whether Mike had decided to take another flight, either that day or since, and they waited around an hour for results of the inquiry. But it was unsuccessful. Mike hadn't been on another flight. Following a few days, police then tried to get in touch with Mike's mom, but she was sadly far too emotional to talk. In the meantime, Maltese authorities had expanded their search for Mike to the neighboring island of Gozo, as well as checking passenger lists for Air Malta and Emirates. They also contacted the company Virtu Ferries, which, as the name suggests, operates ferry services to Sicily. At one point, a patient reached out to the Mansholds and claimed to have spotted Mike. Specifically, he thought he saw his face. The family, of course, went to see this patient straight away, but it turned out that he had not in fact seen Mike, and that it was perhaps just his medication talking. Another man got in touch with police and claimed to have seen the teenager at the Tiger Bar. A year later, in 2017, there were reports of a raid in the bar, which is known for drug trafficking. However, when authorities checked with staff, there were no witnesses regarding Mike's case. Bernd, however, befriended this man, and the two went looking around the island together for a while. Then, on July the 26th, an anonymous caller informed police of a body by the Dingley Cliffs, and this caller was never identified. When Bernd rushed to the scene, TV camera crews were already waiting for him, and by the time he arrived, search dogs had already made a discovery nearby. Still, Band was told to wait at the edge of the cliff for the dogs to do their job. And this was hell for Band. The moment dragged on and on as emergency crews and an ambulance arrived and still, he had no idea what they had found. Then, a white jeep with two stretchers on the roof was seen making its way down the gravel road. Meanwhile, Band, dressed in a beige cap, watched the man in white overalls below him. Overall, 
It took hours of searching before eventually Mike's lifeless body was found, hidden underneath bushes at the bottom of the 250 meters high cliffs. He was found laying on his back. But when Band realized that they had begun to put the remains in a body bag, he immediately left his spot up on the cliff and rushed down to see if this was his son. Band climbed down and opened the bag to look inside. He then saw a dead person and a realization that this could be his son slowly dawned on him. The body had black holes in the neck and the left side of its face. It had already begun to decompose. Bernd fell sick to his stomach and closed the bag. Daniel then also came to check the bag and he thought this could indeed be his brother. But Bernd refused to believe it until he had a DNA test to prove it. To this day, Bernd remembers how at the time he spoke to a Maltese doctor who had told him that Mike's back had been broken twice and it was a quick death. His mountain bike hung a few feet up a bush. Mike's Nike shoes and shades were found near his body, but his backpack was gone. All the content that was in the backpack, so his phone, GoPro camera, credit card, several hundred of euros in cash, straw hat and phone charger had also vanished. Despite looking for it extensively, investigators couldn't find it. But they knew for a fact that Mike had it with him on that day, as both the hotel staff and CCTV footage confirmed that. However, weirdly, fresh hay was found next to Mike's body. Hay that hadn't been affected by the scorching sun whatsoever. When Band asked the farmer who owned the land about this, he said that he had no idea how it got there and he acted strangely towards Band. Later, Band would learn that, as stated in the case files, three pieces of evidence were identified and numbered from the crime scene. A pair of sunglasses, a camera case, and Mike's sneakers. But not his GoPro camera. When Band went to room 105 at the Astra Hotel, he found that the room had already been cleared out. And they had only given him some of his son's belongings, such as his diving equipment but his camera was still missing. Band knew that Mike loved photography, and he'd record pretty much anything of substance. In fact, he had sent several videos to his dad and also told his girlfriend he'd be sending her pictures on the day of the incident. His father was convinced that he would have recorded his journey that day. Also, Mike used to wear his camera attached to his belt, which meant that if he fell from the cliffs, it would be at the crime scene, but it wasn't found. Ben specifically asked about this camera and a female officer at the scene told him that she did in fact see the camera case strapped to Mike's body as she guarded it while investigations were going on. However, all other officers said that there was no camera on his body at all. Band then asked the female officer again and she surprisingly denied ever having said that she saw the case on his body. So did someone else find it and then report the body after taking it? Or were the authorities holding it back to preserve the country's image? Those were legitimate questions that popped up. The next few days were sheer agony for Band, who spent them at the police station, forensics department, court building and the morgue. And the investigation from here on out would be an utter contradiction. When Band looked at some papers that were handed to him, he saw that a possible date of death had been noted, and the cause of death was determined to be unascertained. Unbelievably, it would take nearly two more years for Band to be handed a complete autopsy report. Then, things began to get really weird. On August the 8th, Band went to visit the morgue again, when an employee took him aside and whispered, There are no fractures. Unofficially, she added. Band immediately recalled how he was told that Mike's back had been broken due to a possible fall by the doctor back on the cliff. So now nothing was broken? He then called police and remembers how when he confronted the police officer with this, she was evasive. At this point, not only was Band worried, but the police officer in charge straight up asked him when he would be leaving the island again. As in, when will you stop bothering us? This is also when Band began to lose faith in the police force and slowly in Malta's authorities. 
He then made his way to the forensics department again, where he was given a Canon camera, an older model than Mike's, with a broken chip. As of this day, Mike's camera has never been found. His grey backpack, phone, wallet, credit card by the bank Sparkasse, cash, straw hat and extra charger have also never resurfaced. Ben was later told by Maltese authorities that it's very unlikely that a Maltese person killed his son and it must be a tourist because Maltese people, they don't do things like that. On August 17th, Mike's body was then transferred to Bremen and on August 20th, his 18th birthday, he was laying in a casket. When the funeral director then opened the casket and expected the smell of preservation chemicals, he instead smelled a still decomposing body and immediately rung the police. The case was then taken over by the Oldenburg Stadt police station. And when yet another investigation kicked off, they noticed that the body was very light, far too light in fact. And there was a horrible reason for that. Mike's body had arrived without the brain, heart, liver, lungs, stomach, pancreas, adrenal glands, right kidney, urinary, bladder, prostate, small intestine, as well as other organs. From the left kidney, colon, spleen and diaphragm, there were only fragmented remains left. Bernd, who knew Mike was not an organ donor, contacted the Maltese authorities and demanded the organs be sent to Germany. And this was a grieving father about to lay his child to rest. You can only imagine the pain. Three people were present for the first autopsy and one of them, the forensic doctor who examined the body, emailed Bernd to say that the organs had already been missing when the body arrived for the autopsy. He added that they were probably eaten by rodents. Very awful thing to say to a grieving father. But more strangely, this doctor changed his statement, which he gave twice. Once, he said the organs had been eaten by mice, then by rats. As for Mike's brain, well, he reckoned it simply dissolved in the sun. As a result, the disappearance case, as it still had been in Germany, became a crime investigation as German authorities believed a third party could have been involved in Mike's death. To that end, they also accessed Mike's phone data but weren't able to find anything. Around this time, a second autopsy was performed for legal clarity in Germany and the results were far from promising. Bernd was told that Mike's body had not been embalmed and that the cause of death could no longer be determined. Just FYI, the embalming was required to be done by a physician in Malta, but they chose not to. Basically, embalming slows down decomposition, very important to note. Even a novice physician would do this, especially seeing as Mike's body was going to be sent to Germany for his burial. It would have been the respectful thing to do to preserve this young man's body for his family, to have a somewhat proper goodbye. The fact that they didn't do this speaks volumes. The German forensics team also couldn't find any bite marks and said that some of the brain should have been preserved even if the sun was to melt it. German forensic scientists couldn't find anything that would prove this was indeed a 30 meter drop, nor did they find any evidence of lethal violence. The body had no large wounds or anything of the sort, so they determined that a fall would have been practically impossible, especially seeing as his ribs were fully intact. Still, Maltese authorities stuck to their conclusion that Mike accidentally fell. On September the 4th, 2016, Mike and his dad went on their last voyage together as they boarded the MS Mackey. The voyage was recorded in the ship's logbook. And at 12.13 p.m., the captain handed over Mike's remains to the sea. Now, there are eight theories as to what could have really happened to Mike, but to this day, none of these have been confirmed. The first theory is, of course, that Mike actually did have an accident, that perhaps he tripped over something or slipped and fell down the cliffs while carrying the bike on his back. But questions remain. Why would Mike have climbed the rocks given the heat? For the view? Why wouldn't he have just taken the scenic route by bike instead? And why did he not wear shoes? Why was the bike located higher up the slope, way above his body? And apart from a twisted bike seat and rare flat tire, everything else was intact. Plus, if this was an accident, 
his belongings would surely be next to him. Also, German authorities have but excluded a fall as a possibility, while Maltese authorities won't give up this theory. The second theory is that Mike was accidentally killed by a hunter. But this theory, as well as most of the following ones, are highly unlikely due to the state of Mike's remains. A popular theory is that Mike got into an accident while on his bike. People speculated that maybe someone drove into him with a car and then tried to make it look like a fall. This also seems unlikely as his bike was found on top of the cliffs, his body at the bottom, and he wasn't wearing shoes, odd arrangement to say the least. Another theory suggests that he was robbed seeing as most of his belongings are missing, and this might be true in some part. Yet another theory, fueled by the missing state of his organs, was that he was the victim of organ trafficking. They were never returned to Bremen. However, this isn't very likely to have occurred. Organs, if they are to be transplanted, aren't removed outdoors. Plus, the perpetrators would have had to take the body and bicycle to the cliffs after the organ removal and arrange them just as they were found without leaving any DNA behind. This will be quite the operation. A sad theory is that Mike ended his own life. However, according to the autopsy results, he couldn't have done this by jumping and nothing else could be traced given the state of decomposition. Also, Mike was adventurous, happy, in love, and looking forward to his future, especially to more traveling with his dad. So this theory seems the least likely. Another one has it that Mike's organs were removed by the hospital to hide his cause of death and make it look like a fall in order to preserve Malta's reputation, something I already touched on. And the last theory was that he died of a heat stroke or dehydration. Obviously, because of how much his body had decomposed, it couldn't be determined whether he suffered a heat stroke or was dehydrated. But these are among the reasons speculated to have caused his fall. I also don't recall reading on him carrying a water bottle, but he seemed a sensible guy and more importantly, was very athletic. What German authorities know for certain is that Mike did not die from a gunshot wound, as his skull wasn't damaged and there was no blunt force trauma. But they can't prove that there was no internal bleeding or that Mike suffocated. What's more, his hyoid bone was missing, and that particular bone helps determine whether an individual was strangled. Mike's dad believes that two people were at the scene, one his son and the other whoever took the backpack. He has since visited Malta on several occasions pleading for the case to be reopened in the country. And in 2018, it did. All case files, around 200 pages, were also sent to Bernd, but the Maltese judge gave the same verdict, accidental fall. Bernd had considered suing the forensic doctor who chose not to embalm Mike, as well as other people. But in the end, he decided against it as it would be far too much trauma for him. In Germany, the case remains open to this day, but authorities aren't actually sure that where Mike was found was actually where he was murdered. And as for Malta, his dad traveled there last summer to reopen the case. Whether that happened, I do not know. I couldn't find an article on it, but I do hope that he succeeds. And that's it. What do you guys think actually happened? I've no idea personally. I do feel like maybe it's unlikely that he was found with without his organs, but that maybe something went wrong with the Maltese authorities and them doing the autopsy. Obviously, I don't know, I'm not an expert. But um, do leave me a comment down below and I'll see you next week. Bye Gators!